In this video, we're going to talk about the abstract definition of a vector bundle. Now, technically, we don't really need to go that far if we're just talking about tensors in physics. It, they really just sort of arise from multiple copies of the tangent bundle and cotangent bundle. But already then, even just saying that, uh, the way that we combine these things does kind of depend on the general definition of a vector bundle. And the tangent bundle itself is an instance of a, of a more general vector bundle. So I think it's worth taking this little, well, not even detour. It is kind of necessary if you want to be absolutely precise about what tensors are in physics and their relation to the abstract tensor product we saw at the beginning of this entire series. Um, so let's jump into that. And the important thing to keep in mind throughout all of this is the example that we have of the tangent bundle being a particular case of a vector bundle. So just keep that example in mind as we go through this. So a vector bundle is, um, of course, we want the main manifold of our interest that we're working over. Uh, it's going to be a manifold. In fact, we're going to have another manifold and a map, we think of a projection map, it's going to be a continuous differentiable map from the total space to what we call the base space X. Um, and of course, again, these definitions work just as well for complex manifolds. So if I'm saying, you know, diffeomorphism, differentiable, you can replace that with holomorphic. You can replace all the instances of the real numbers I'm using with the complex numbers, et cetera. So, what we have is uh, right this continuous differentiable map, and so you know, keeping in mind again our our tangent bundle uh, case E is like the total space of the of the tangent bundle, right? And well, what does it mean to be a vector bundle? Remember again, the tangent bundle was a sort of consistent assignment, right? We had at each point in our manifold we had something that represented the tangent space. Um, and the fact that we made it into this bundle was just a sort of consistent way of gluing it together. So the general definition of, of a vector bundle should say that for each little x and x, the fiber above that point has the structure of a vector space. Moreover, we want to approximate this by things we understand. So what do I mean by that? For example, in the definition of a manifold itself, right? It said around um, around every point in the manifold, there should be some open set um, that looks like a, 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 some open set of the real numbers, right? Um, so locally, things just look like R to the N, and then we can do calculus, right? So Again, for a bundle, it should look like something that we can understand. Um, and sort of you sort of think about how do we assign a vector space to each point? Well, you know, the sort of the sort of stupid way would to just be take the Cartesian product, right? Like that'd be a very easy way. For example, you know, if I had some, some open set, you know, times uh, R to the K, this gives me above, a, you know, and, and, and we sort of have a, a projection map onto the first factor. This gives us the structure of a vector space above each point, right? Um, I mean, this has, a, this has a very understandable manifold structure, right? I mean, we're assuming our open set looks like R to the N for some N, a Cartesian product with R to the K, it looks like R to the N plus K, right? And uh, well, what would be the vector space structure? Well, for some given little u, um, you know, we need to define the vector space structure above some point. So, for example, what would addition look like? Well, it's it's sort of the obvious choice, right? How do I uh, too many u's? But it's a good thing we have vector notation. Uh, what should I define the the sum of these to be? Well, it'll just be v plus u in the in the second coordinate, right? And this still loves, uh, lives uh, uh, in the fiber above little u without the vector sign. So locally, this should just look like a product, right? So so our, our vector bundle are these pieces of data subject to a few more conditions, right? So I, I want it to be the case that for all x, uh, there exists some open set 
So again, same sort of vibes that we get from simply doing, you know, differential geometry, talking about atlases and whatnot. For every X, there should be some open set um, and a choice of diffeomorphism from U cross R to the K to uh, the inverse image over that open set, right? So this first condition is saying locally, uh, it needs to, the, the fiber over each open set needs to just look like this basic Cartesian product because that's a thing we can understand. Um, and it needs to be subject to, to some conditions, right? So pi composed with psi applied to x uh, some vector, um, really I should say y some vector, um, is 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 equal to to v for all uh, points y in this open set, right? So that's just saying um, again. That's just sort of like the definition of of a section, right? It's just making sure we have some sort of um, coherence condition and making sure each of those things stay in the fibers, right? And there's also a vector space structure here that we want to respect. And we want that vector space structure to be consistent with the geometric structure. So we don't just want there to be some sort of vector space structure, but we should say that this particular diffeomorphism psi, right? That's realizing this diffeomorphism with the Cartesian product. That also needs to be respecting the linear structure. By which I mean that the map, that simply sends uh, a vector in the vector space r to the k to psi at x v. This particular map, um, and and of course this this lives in the fiber above the point x. This needs to be a linear isomorphism as well. Right. So this map psi is doing two different jobs. Right. It's realizing this this sort of geometric isomorphism while simultaneously preserving the vector space structure. So what are some examples of this? Well, um, first, the, the stupid example, uh, if your whole manifold, uh, uh, you just take the whole thing to be the Cartesian product, right? A vector bundle is something that locally looks like this Cartesian product. So if globally it looks like this Cartesian product, then locally it looks like the Cartesian product. Right. So, I mean, to be precise, I should tell you, you know, the projection map literally just projects onto the first factor. So we can see that this is uh, surjective. Uh, it's certainly um, as well. OK, you need to do the work. You need to do the proofs. But um, this is a smooth map. Right. Just a projection map. Um, and all of these other all of these other things are satisfied, right? I mean, by this little argument I cooked up over here, we still need to talk about scalar multiplication, et cetera, but you can see how we're going to give a linear structure uh, to the fiber above each point, right? So this is called the trivial bundle, right? Because it, it, in some sense, it, it, it's not really um, all that interesting. For example, um, let's consider S1, right? So um, it turns out that S1, uh, just, just the circle, if we think about its tangent bundle, right? Well, we can sort of imagine, you know, we can draw pictures in the 2D plane of all the tangent spaces at each point. Um, but remember, even though in this picture, these tangent spaces seem to be intersecting at these points, um, we don't really conceive of it that way, right? We don't think of those tangent spaces as actually being embedded in R2. We don't even actually think of S1 being embedded in R2, right? This is the benefit of the abstract definition of a manifold. So maybe a more accurate way to draw this picture then would be to rotate each one of these tangent spaces so that it no longer looks like they're intersecting. So we can, e even though precisely this isn't embedded in R3. We can draw a picture in R3. So now I have my copy of S1 and now I'm going to draw, you know, my, my tangent space uh, going 
vertically. And so we sort of get this picture of this infinite uh, cylinder in R3. And this is actually no different. So, so the way that we've dr drawn it here, we can see that this is really um, just diffeomorphic to S1 cross the real numbers, right? So it turns out that the tangent bundle of S1 is trivial. Uh, this for a non-trivial example, um, think about the Mobius strip, right? So this is some sort of weird um, product that we take, um, you know, we, we take this weird uh, product of the interval zero to one over um, S1, right? And so hovering above each point of uh, S1, we have a, a, a fiber of just the closed interval zero to one. But now I want you to imagine uh, extending this further instead of just a closed interval, imagine each one of these um, is the a copy of the real numbers. And okay, it's kind of hard to draw, um, but now we get this weird sort of twisted uh, thing that, that locally just looks like a product, but globally now there's this vector bundle with a twist. There's a couple examples. Um, and of course, like I said, you know, if, if you go back, you look at the previous video about the tangent bundle and track through the things that we said about it, it turns out that the tangent bundle um, above some manifold, this gives you the data of a vector bundle. So I think I'm, in the name of keeping things short, I'm going to leave it there. And in the next video, we're going to talk about uh, some special facts about vector bundles, some interesting things we can do with them, and a very interesting connection to the Octonians.